You're listening to Experience This, a show about the emerging experience economy with your host, Tom Young. Hey, thanks. I'm here in the uh, labs here at Hook and Loop. Uh, Hook and Loop is a um, in-house design for Infor. And for those of you not familiar with Infor, Infor is uh, one of the largest private tech providers in the world. I think valued at a little over $10 billion. Uh, founded uh, after the dot-com. And uh, you guys are pretty big now. You've got about close to 20,000 employees. And I'm sitting here with uh, Nunzio Esposito. The, uh, as we heard about him, he's the, uh, the Jesus of design thinking. So oh, today, today we want to talk a little bit about design thinking and how uh, Infor and Hook and & Loop are doing that in uh, the world of technology. We had a pre-conversation. And so, uh, Nunzio, why don't you just give us a little bit of background on Hook and & Loop and what Infor is doing, what you're doing. Sure. So, uh, hey, everybody. Nunzio here. Um, we're in our seventh year uh, within the organization. Uh, when Infor moved its headquarters to New York, uh, Hook and Loop was a concept of our CEO, Charles Phillips. Uh, he always imagined taking uh, creatives that n didn't necessarily have the discipline of enterprise software, uh, throw them uh, into the mix, or let's just say the muck of uh, you know the complexities that our businesses are, are our businesses and our customers are faced with and essentially use the best of what design is all about, uh, leveraging a lot of different uh, tools in our toolkit to try to see if we could evolve uh, our enterprise software. And um, over the years, uh, Hook and Loop has actually gone through a lot of different flavors. Um, and I would tell you that through its maturity- Now you've been here the whole time? Uh, let's see, I came she in- She said at seven years, have you been yeah, here the whole- so I came in at 2014. Okay. Um, that's right when I think you started to see a lot of growth yeah. uh, within Hook and Loop. And uh, at that time, a lot of the, de the dev leadership and the executive team uh, really wanted to double down on user experience here at M4. So that's right when I came in. Um, it's been a very interesting journey. Um, but in this, in this new flavor, as that's the way I like to call it, uh, Hook and Loop is really starting to be focused on uh, being driven by kind of like a more builder's mentality. Uh, in its prior years, it was really, I think, design was a little bit in, in its infancy. Uh, was really kind of driven by the well, creative the, intellect. The term today is is used like you know, almost like digital is used. It's, it's people say, and at some level, they're just giving lip service to actually giving a shit about the customer experience. Dope, you just dropped the S word. I'm liking I'm it. I'm just saying, like, you, but you know, so in our pre conversations, it seems like well, you guys, I would say, distinguish yourself a little bit is think of it as uh, engineering meets design. That's a is good that way fair? to put it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I typically say builders over creativity or something like that. I don't know. It doesn't, it's not as smooth, but. So tell a little bit about, I thought was an interesting, because this is what I really thought about engineering meets design concept when you said you used to have a seven designer to one engineer ratio and you, and you flipped that. Tell yeah. us why you did that. Well, I, it, I think it was more of, uh, I think, designers, and I'm a designer by trade. Right. Um, I think you had a hard time handling the translation. Um, typically, I think, uh, as we were engaging with a lot of our product teams, translation was handled through, hey, wouldn't this be a really cool idea? And while we listened to a couple of these use cases, I came up with this really cool POC. And if you could just build that, everything's going to be amazing. And by the way, we have that like tagline on a wall down here. Right. Reality was, it wasn't amazing. Um, what happened was, I think it had a lot of good, like, you know, it was good for school of thought, and I think that it had the right intent. Um, but to handle the translation required a lot of different uh, skill sets that I don't think Hook and Loop at the time had. Um, you know, part of it was uh, the maturity of our design system. Um, I think it was also the ability for us to see our work through. Um, you know, when you're working with a company that is somewhat built on an M&A type of culture, you know, a lot of yeah, products. So that's, that's important because you guys, uh, a lot of your growth has been through acquisition. Yep. So you are dealing with disparate legacy systems. And so while you're you know, a relatively new firm, less than 20 years, um, you're not a greenfield firm. Right. So a lot of greenfield firms can focus on design and without the engineering issues to yep. deal with of legacy. But you, yep. you're ensconced in legacy. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's actually not even the, I don't think it's um, so much the legacy or the, com the complexity of some of the platforms or, you know, some of the uh, engineering languages and et cetera. You have to understand what you also comes with that which is some of the complexities of the people, the right. mental models, the behaviors and the ways in which they're working. 
Um, and you have to understand, like, when you throw design in that, you know, it's like, you know, you throw a lot of shit up against the wall and something's going to stick. Right. Um, not a lot stuck. <laughs> like, it took it took a lot of time. Like, I mean, we were uh, contributing and delivering a lot of value, but it wasn't until we flipped the model to be very more engineering focused where, like, real rubber meets the road feasibility started to emerge. Right. And through that immersion of traction, you start to realize like you don't really need that many designers. Because what happens is you get a lot of designers in a room, you know, and I'm not trying to be like stereotypical, but it's like, you know, you get a lot of like executives in a room and you're like, and they're gonna figure it out. And you're going, eh, you only know like certain pieces. So, you know, take a lot of designers, throw a lot of designers in the room and without the right cross-functional like collaboration, and a really strong understanding of our current technology, where the technology needs to go, and the engineering mindset that's back there, design gets lost in translation. Um, and that's something that we saw. So over the, the two years that I've been leading this team, you know, we flipped the model, and we also realized that we need to sink our teeth into something that Infor isn't answering right now. Uh, and that's been doubling down on native mobile. And if you take a step back and think about an enterprise, native brings in a lot of complexities. And when you look at it from a cost perspective, you're going, how am I going to sustain and manage two different platforms, iOS and Android? And you know, I need specific development teams right. to handle each of those. What does support look like? What happens if I get 200 customers on it? And each of those customers have 700,000 users. I mean, that's the stuff that you know, our hook and loop and Infor is challenged with. Um, and it takes a very interesting design mindset uh, to be able to embrace you know, those kind of constraints. I don't call them constraints, I call them like opportunities. Right. Um, but So how would you profile that. the people at Hook and Loop in the, uh, the ideal designer relative to, uh, if I just did a LinkedIn search on people who said they were designers, they might not fit that profile. How does your profile different <laughs> than the stereotype of a design oh. thinker? Well, A, I don't know if they're really, they're not, re I don't know if they're really tagging Hook and Loop on, on LinkedIn. I'm hoping they're tagging Infor. Right. Uh, you know, I'm proud to be working at Infor. Um, I would tell you that if you looked at the typical landscape of our designers, so right. if you're not asking about loopers, but you're just talking about our design team in general, they come from very different backgrounds. Like I have a designer getting interviewed by the Wall Street Journal just because of her unique uh, background in, you know, in print design and how she got into technology right. and engineering uh, design. Um, but if you were to look at them, I think it's more of you take a step back and LinkedIn's actually not going to capture it. You know, LinkedIn does a really good job of looking at credentials, accolades, education. Let's not get on that topic. Um, and you know, LinkedIn does something. Give me a lot of attributes that people can like, so you get really known on something. And like, I can't look at that stuff. Like, that's a lot of fluff, right? For me, uh, what we what we see is there needs to be an appetite and a hunger for constraints and complexity. Um, you need to be able to understand a lot of the things that I think Harvard Business Review is writing, but I don't really think people understand how that translates to them, which is like the true social and emotional intelligence. Like I am talking, I say true, right. because I don't think anybody's really writing it effectively. Um, you, you, m and culture, what do you take when you have a development team that has been developing for 25 years out of Wisconsin and you throw in a couple of loopers from New York that think it's just like really easy to come up with some prototypes and everyone's gonna love it and they're gonna build it and it's gonna be just like, oh my God, and we're gonna win design awards and everyone's gonna write about us. I'm using that as a continuum. Yeah. And you go like, how do you close that gap? And so do you, do you think it's because the, the hard work of implementing design is way underestimated? I, Look, I mean, my background came from more a creative agency type background. Right. That's where I started when I came out of college. Um, and it was very fascinating. The only way to translate design into like demonstrability or actually being rolled out, it didn't have all those complexities. You were really just trying to drive consensus. And you know, I learned a lot there in my younger years of my career. Get thrown into the enterprise and understanding where they're coming from, what they're trying to achieve, the customers that are occurring on, currently on that, and then hearing where the company needs to go because you know we're getting our second wave of funding and you know we want to go IPO. 
I mean, you take all this stuff like into consideration, you cannot plot it on X, Y, or Z. Right. Like use every letter of the alphabet and then try to plot how you're gonna be making decisions. And a lot of it sometimes takes some, in, you know, um, the ability to kind of like make some calls with your gut based on what you're hearing from all of these stakeholders. And that is not anything that I have seen that you're gonna get from some education that you've taken to some blog posts that you've read to some continuing ed courses that you might have taken. So it, more school of hard knocks. Yeah, totally, man. It's totally like Jay Z. So tell us, um, tell us a little bit. Give us a, a sample problem you're working on right now. What, what give us one of the challenges and how the design thinking affects your solutioning? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, do I love IDO and being able for them to like market and coin what design thinking is all about? Yeah, like amazing. Um, but when you come to it, I mean, everything that design thinking is about is essentially like what design is all about. <laughs> you know, it's like identifying what the problems are and trying to figure out solutions to make it better. Let's break it down into simple, uh, you know, simple, simple pieces. Um, I would tell you one of the things that we're learning right now, um, and it's a little bit of like in a miracle that we're having some successes. Um, and I have some of my team members in this room for those that are on the podcast, it's pretty badass that they're here. Um, you know, we're building, we've built and we have shipped ongoing like a native mobile experience for Infor. So I'll use one as an example, expense management. Mm -hmm. And our competitor there is like SAP Concur, which right. probably a lot of people have heard of, right? right. Or you've right. heard of Expensify right. or, right. you know, some of those. Um, when you look at what our system does, and that's where Infor really stands on its own, it handles a ton of complexity of business rules, unique legal, you know, taxes that like Concur actually could not stand up next to. Like really, if you were to go to like looking at all those complexities, it wouldn't even be able to do it. But when you get into the user experience, the ease of onboarding, like all those other pieces, you know, you're kind of going like, oh man, I might, I might go that way, right? Like I might go to our competitor. Our team, and it's, it's, it was a challenge. Like we did not have a lot of the plans. Like we didn't know really what we were going in. It's like, you know, eyes wide shut. Um, we went in and we knew we had to double down. We knew we needed to focus in native and that's not something that other development teams were necessarily focused on. I'm not saying they couldn't do it, but they were focused on. So that gave us like, you know, what Apple calls is like the walled garden, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's a safe space to be able to explore, go do whatever you right. want to do. Um, we went down that path. We brought in some talented, uh, engineers who I gotta be totally blunt, like took a gamble on us because of like what we've encountered and where we were going. Um, and we just went head on. And what we realized was, you know, some of the, you know, the APIs were there, but you know, what's the integrity of those connections? You know, you really put the API, API to the test when you're on the road and, you know, offline capabilities and all this other stuff. So we strategically built a mobility strategy. We don't say mobile, we say mobility. Right. Because every decision you make at an enterprise level needs to be able to have the scale and the impact for God knows how many contexts. So you could double down natively but like those APIs got to be really good. So like 90 other development teams can like pick it up or use it or can be configured or a channel park partner can pick it up or design decisions you're making need to be able to scale. So, so let me play it. So when we look at enterprise architectures, for example, we would make a separation. We would say systems of record versus systems of engagement. And the design element really focuses on the systems of engagement. Mm -hmm. That's what's the, the mm -hmm. human interface. Mm -hmm. But at the edge of system of engagement where humans interface, where you're focusing on design, is very fragile because the backend APIs can change and you have a dynamic environment. And the more legacy it is, the more likely you are to have changes in the backend. And so your design elements uh, are not stable. Oh, there's another one to throw in there. You gotta remember that legacy means not completely cloud deployed. So for things that are like installed on a server, right. computers that might have been the color of Manila, I am saying right. CD and D CD ROM. I'm not kidding. Like right. I'm pausing because it's like, is that even a thing? So they're installed there and then they are like completely configured and customized. Like you have no idea. And then we're going, no worries, get to the cloud. And we're like, handle all that. I just want to throw that in there because design is also accounting for that. So deal with that, go back to the yep. edge, but I just need to throw that in there. Because no, I'm saying so, so are, it sounds to me more like you're, 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 you're concerned about the end to end engineering all the way back to the core so that your design stands up. 100%. So when people think about design thinking, they're thinking about strictly the UX or the mm -hmm. CX, that, that mm -hmm. interface point. Yep. But if you don't get the back end right, 
Uh, you could. It's 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 pretty, but not functional. Yeah, uh, it's Does that, not. Do you even, agree with that? I completely agree with that. But it's not even like getting the back end right and building it for one way. Like, there, uh, like, uh, and my team should be shaking their head in here. I'm sorry if I came yeah, no, across no, from the mic. Right. But like, you can't build it one way. Like, is there an optimized workflow? Yes. Is that optimized workflow work for customer X? Maybe. And it's built for like you know. 70% of those type of user roles, but then there's 30% that like you didn't account for and that workflow like actually doesn't work. You know, you don't, it's funny, like in the market of design thinking and in the enterprise or how someone built an app and how it's like dynamic enough to handle all that complexity, no one really talks about that. And that's why I'm proud to say that like the team that we built, which is a straw man, you know, it's, it's building, it's on, the gr it's on the ground level going, we're starting to account for that and that is what is amazing. So are, are, Nuns, are most of your uh, deployments now largely about putting the functionality of your acquired software and your software platforms into a mobile uh, deployment? Uh, not everything. Um, I would say it depends. Sometimes they're driven by like customer demand, right? Like, uh, like a lot of companies, like customer X wants this, you know, and that's really good for us because we get the content, you know, we get like the end user access. Uh, sometimes it's driven by analyst inputs and like market demand. Um, so not everything is really, I would say, getting thrown through the lens of native mobile. Uh, what we did strategically around three or four years ago is we built a design system that accounted for responsive design. And you know, that's not anything that's new. You know, it was pretty much a, a good web best practice in 2011, 2012. Right. Became a best practice in software, say in and around that time. Um, a lot of our software today and that's, uh, that's what's amazing with Infor. I mean, they really doubled down on that R&D and they did achieve that. And that's a massive uh, effort all in its own right. When you look at our competitors, you know, they're really focused less on the M&A and more on what they're building net new and trying to make sure that it hits that like certain criteria. But for us, we embraced our M&A culture and we build it net new and we ensured that it applied to all those guidelines and you know, all those best practices. So how do you deal with, uh, you know, the next acquisition gets announced in yeah. two months, you go in. Yeah, we say, just okay. had one last week, so okay. yeah. So you got to go into that team and, uh, and maybe you want to put a design overlay or integrate it into an yep. existing platform. Uh, and you got the, well, you're touching my baby. <laughs> you so know, you probably got some good, tell us a touching my baby uh, story that's going to be. Oh, God. You can't uh, do that. I actually, I actually went through one. But in general, I think the big thing that we did last year and then I'll get into the, the experience right. that I had. The big one, that, the big thing that we did last year was in March, we actually open sourced our design system. And I know that might like not be earth shattering for like the 20 or 30 people that are in this garage right now right. or the listeners, but like reality is like in the context of enterprise software and like Infor that is starting to really embrace a lot of those in the more modern methodologies and principles, that was like monumental because it not only gave and started to empower our development teams to feed into uh, what needed to happen there, but it empowered like our channel partners and our customers. And or at times, we're hearing like agencies or actually design teams going, we pulled your repo, like we're using some of your stuff, which is like a little for me, you know, gives me some goosebumps because like that's badass. Um, so we did that. And that's how I have an, uh, that's how us and our team have an answer for a lot of the, the right. companies that are coming on or that we are acquiring. We're going like, go here first, see what you can do before you activate us. Right. Because you can't, you can't scale through people. It's just, it's not a good modern best practice. For the experience that I went through, uh, was through an acquisition that we had, uh, which was in the retail sector for uh, POS, which is like point of sale. Um, and that was very fascinating. I remember flying out to Austin, Texas after we acquired them, like all pumped, all excited. They had some native solutions um, and they were just basically going like, and who are you? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, I have long You're hair. A Yan You're was, a Yankee. Yeah, I was like, you have long hair, I have long hair. Damn, we got some good hair. There you go. Um, and that was the dev leader, Sadir. Um, but I was basically like, look, you know, like we're here, we're here to help, you know, what does UX really mean to you? I spoke to their product managers and their BAs. Right. And I was like, how do you make your decisions based on the experience? And um, that was very interesting because it was the first time I met a team that actually really focused on UX first. Uh, so I think they really embraced us. 
there wasn't a lot of tension there. They were kind of just saying like, hey, our BA is doing a lot of these wireframes and all these other things and accounting for X, Y, and Z. Can you like take a look at that? And the minute that they opened up, you know, that like Pandora box, right. they basically said, why don't you join our, you know, our development planning sessions? And then it was going like, why don't you come to like our sprint planning? Then it was going, hey, nuns, like since you're a director, I was a director at the time, uh, maybe you could work with product management and start feeding like our backlog. And I'm like, are you serious? Is this like really happening right now? And before you know it, we had like multiple backlogs, like one that was accounting for like UX, one that was accounting for the research and the insights we were getting from our customers. They gave us access, the ability to travel. You know, I don't think you get that at a lot of places. Um, and Infor really like welcomed it. So when we went, we want to work with, and our, one of our customers is Zoomies. So I don't know if you guys know, it's like skates, mm -hmm. snowboard type shit. Um, they allowed us to like follow their store associates. Like I went to so many stores, I can't even imagine. You know, one in New York, one out in uh, Seattle, you know, and then obviously I did my own contextual inquiries because of the mall that, you know, near me, but I was just like watching how they were working, how they were using the system. And it was like, once you got into their shoes, and it wasn't a new pair of Vans that they gave me. They didn't right. give me shit, I had to buy right. it. Um, but like once you got into their shoes, you started to see some of the complexities. How, how did they look at the software and how could they embrace a better customer experience? So as we started doing that, we started actually being able to build net new features. So I would tell you like the experience that I had, leveraging design thinking, getting into customer journeys, getting into the DNA of who the user is and what the system is, that team loved it. So, so would you, if I use the term, experiential empathy that huh. you really only get. I'm going to give that one to Chuck, who's there behind me. He handles some of those things. Experiential empathy, no trademark on that. Yeah. But it's really going out and actually seeing what the work you do from the customer's perspective, so you really get a sense of what you're doing. Because you, it, it's so easy to make a design or an engineering decision, in, in, infected by the design, to make things more functional and easier and more stable but to understand the downstream impact, you know, if I create, uh, when we were sitting here, I, was, I had to watch you do multiple sign-ons versus oh, don't single talk sign to me about this so you security got, crap. So, and the security guys are, are putting multiple sign-ons to make their lives easier right. at the expense of user experience. Well, yeah, they're creating drag for all the employees. So what they're realizing is like the employees are going irate, right. like what is IT really doing? Right, right. And so that's an important part. So uh, let me ask one, one more question and, we'll, yeah. and Rohan will get some questions in the audience. But I know you have a, uh, you also have a passion for uh, getting young people. And so I'm going to go there. Oh, baby. Here and, we go. I'm taking, uh, a, I'm taking another swig of vino. That's is that it. totally cool? I, that's, that's absolutely cool. Uh, and you've done some teaching at NYU and FIT and trying to get young people to start thinking about uh, design. So let me ask a, a question to get a sense of where your head's at. Does, do engineers with design desire make better, uh, better loopers than designers who want to learn about technology? Who? what is going on right now? I think I got it to tell you yeah. extra swig. Um, I would actually tell you both benefit. I think both, both there have a lot of pros and less cons. You know, there's a lot of articles and things that are going on in the industry, like should a designer really learn all the engineering ins and outs? And should, do you get a better designer if they know engineering? Or do you, get a, do you have a unicorn engineer that like understands UX? Um, I think for us at Hook and Loop and the loopers that we've been looking for, I like less specialization and more generalist type of aspects. So I'm a big, big component of, you should know like 40 or 50 or 60% of like your core discipline. If it's visual design, it's visual design. But that like other 50%, let's add in 20% of just like grit. Cause if you do not have grit, you ain't gonna cut it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like 30% of like understanding some of more, you know, modern front end frameworks or understanding what API or technology architecture is, understanding to look at a architecture diagram, be able to like synthesize point A to point B, that stuff matters. And for an engineer, if they don't understand the translation of like some of the tools that design is using, some of the processes or some of the strategic thinking that it's bringing, then a lot of what happens is you try to do what's the best of doing cross-functional and you throw them all in a room. And then like, you know, I'm not in all those meetings and some of my managers or my directors are not in all those meetings. And then you like run a monthly check-in and you're going, so how's everything going? I saw the roadmap and everybody thinks it's amazing. And then you realize like, 
uh, I don't know like what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And uh, that dev is waiting for like this design file. And I don't think anybody reviewed it. And you're going like, what? Like when I start hearing some of those things, you get into like, feels yeah. like a little bit more like archaic kind of like waterfall type process. So I would tell you that generalist mindset, uh, having the openness for our loopers to be able to like cross streams. Yep. It's like doing the Ghostbuster moment that is good. So the term, the term I get, I get, a, I get, I get teased by my team sometimes using words out of the, uh, the, the back part of the dictionary, but it sounds even, like what you're looking for is a, poly a polymath. Yes. I read that article. There was a good article from MIT okay. on that. So it, it, it's not one or the other. Yep. It's everything. Yes. And uh, we were talking before, before the, we started recording about the notion, and we have this philosophy at Rumjog, which is in order to participate, you need really two criteria, which is, it, and I, I want to say what it's not first. It's not credentials. I love that you said that. It's a attitude mm -hmm. and aptitude. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to do it. So, you, you know, pikers, sorry, go dig a ditch. Um, but you have to have the attitude that you're going to go willing to learn new things and challenge your existing paradigms. Now, would you... Would you agree that that's critical for successful loopers here? I would say 100%. Now, would I say that we have that at scale? I think that, you know, like anything, we're, we're constantly growing. And growing doesn't necessarily mean in numbers. Could mean in, like, mindsets, approaches, and things like that. So something that I say is if you want to be a looper, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like, and that is something that I, like, fundamentally believe in. That is what I've told students that I've had or lectures that I have given. Like the uncomfortableness is something that everybody should like really welcome. Um, it's the concept of like what you might see as like continuous learning or school of thought and like all these other pieces. Like you don't need degrees, you know, like all these degrees are just like credentials as you're right, saying. Right, right, right. Um, but you know, I think, I think next gen workers, next gen loopers, loopers that we have, where we wanna grow, trying to grow some of our team, you know, you get a lot of, you get a lot of tension when you bring things like that up and I see it in some of my one-on-ones or some of my crits and, and things like that. But the minute you get that response that someone's uncomfortable, you should stop for a second and be like, hell yeah. Now I was gonna say the F word, but like, hell yeah. Like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And they like look at you sometimes like cross the board, like what? You know, like despicable me type of moment, like right. light bulb. Right. And you're going like, that's actually what I wanted to hear. You're, you're saying you're not ready for that? Dope. Guess right. what? We're right. doubling down there. You're going there. Right. And the, and it's like, uh, I'm like, but don't like worry. Like we're going to be there. Like, don't worry about it. Or if we have to figure out some outside thing, like we're going to bring that in. Um, I think for education, getting back to like next gen workers, that is something that like 100% needs to be like widely adopted because as fast paced as technology is going, um, you can learn something today and know that like two months from now, it's potentially might not be relevant. And that was the thing, the reason why I challenged myself even at teaching. It was kind of like the school's going like, what's your curriculum or what's your syllabus? And you're like, yeah, okay. Like I can plot 14 weeks, but the reality is like, this is in like the digital context. So the thing I might be teaching like next week is like actually not relevant next week. And I want to wait to like what's seeing what's coming out. And that's just like, go they're going like, huh? Yeah, yeah. Like, huh? So what I did was, oh God. Yep, here's my syllabus, went with the flow when you're going into the class. And it, it led to a more meaningful, I think, experience, not only for myself, but for like the students, meaning who needs to like capture this, in yep, these yep. insights and these learnings. So we, ro uh, we roll that way. Yeah, I think you have to. Yeah. Society is like not ready for a lot of these things. I say society, meaning like whatever context, they're not really ready for being uncomfortable and you know it across the board. Anybody that's in this room, talk to their parents about like technology, or like, I'm like, mom, I'm going to school for design. So you're gonna design business cards? You know, it's like, yeah. uh, that think that was called a letterpress like back in the day. Yeah. Like, I'm not talking about that, you know? Yeah. So sometimes you just shut your mouth to go do your thing and carry on. All right, so Rohan, let's, let's, why don't we get some questions from the audience here? So does uh, anyone have any questions? Let's open it up to the floor. No? Rowan, didn't we plant some questions? Uh, I, I thought... I thought this guy... Uh, did some I planted seating. one on Amir. He's usually quite good at... Uh, did some seating. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, so one thing you touched on, and uh, you touched on it a couple of times when we've spoken previously, is around um, design thinking or, or taking the user-centric approach to design. 
Um, it kind of falls flat on its face a bit with some of the software products you design because you can design it one way for one user and then the dynamic complexity of the software, there's so many different users touching it, mm -hmm. it can sometimes fall flat on its face fairly quickly. So like, how do you guys kind of cope and address that dynamic complexity and how do you kind of make sure that you're trying to design for um, not just one user but, but multiple users across? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a good question. I think we have multiple ways of handling that. You know, you if you work with one customer, you need to understand that there's like other customers. Like if you don't know that, like point blank, like right. that's not gonna happen. Um, so, you know, you want a good consortium of like different customers. I think what we've learned is that a lot of our software works in a lot of different industries. Um, so you want an array of customers. Like you're not gonna like just double down. Like retail is a good example. You know, if you think about the POS for retail and you take like, you know, a, a fashion com a com company, like, let's just use Best Buy as an example. You have to think how, you know, an enterprise company would be looking at that. Like, the POS there might find its way into hospitality for a hotel. It's a similar type of convert, you know, it's a similar type of uh, transaction. It's not a goods of buying a TV. It's the goods of purchasing a room. So, like, for us at Hook and Loop, we actually want those very unique type of customers. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you do the best of what design thinking is. And I think it's a lot of things that everyone's heard through marketing or you know, mm -hmm. marketing and propaganda, or you know, you've worked in it or have used that type of process. You come up with a concept or a POC, you know, a proof of concept. When you do that, if you're not open to like scrutinize the living crap out of that and think about like all the things that it needs to answer, then typically those POCs like fall flat on their face. So, um, do you guys use uh, super users to inform your design? Yo, oh, whoa! Did you just bring that up? Yeah. All right. Yo, man, you you work in the enterprise? <laughs> yeah. um, that's very funny. You just said that because typically, sidebar conversation. Uh, typically, when we talk to super users, they don't want to see any change. And why is that? Because they might have been four years doing one thing, or ten years, or to be totally crazy before Infor acquired that software, they've been doing that role for 15. I say 15 because I can't remember anywhere I stayed for 15 years. And while they did that, that means that they understand when they punch in at nine o'clock and they leave at five, they have a set of functions and they know the way in which they need to interact with the tool. That's all they really want. So the minute you might provide new functionality and a better way to do something quicker, they go irate. Irate like on another level. Like I'm talking about like some famous meme for looking up irate or if you have the GIF, GIFI Slack plugin, type irate and see what comes up. That's the moments we get. So I think it, it depends on what we're working for. Uh, typically for those POCs, if we take like true, tried and true like design thinking, we, we sometimes actually don't bring in the super user. Um, and I know people might cringe or like bite their inner cheek, but there's a reason for that. Like they will not brace the new. So if you go down that path, come up with the POC and then scrutinize the living crap out of it and find from a value engineering perspective why that matters, you're starting to then figure out while you're engineering, what is the change management or the operational changes that need to come in place so that they can get behind it. Like if you do not build a religion or like a campaign and like go to do it, I'm telling you right now, it's going nowhere. When Reddit came out with their new interface, I kept going and say, go back to the old desktop site. Yeah. And now they turned that off. So I got to use Isn't Craigslist just amazing? Yeah, it's something. So, well, that's good. Any other questions? I have a question about corporate culture. So, you guys have a pretty what? cool setup here at Hook and Loop. And I'm just thinking, you guys are still within a larger enterprise company mm -hmm. Infor. And maybe it's just what you have observed and we don't have to talk about Infor in specifically, but how do you see design thinking teams and setups like this coexisting within larger organizations that might not be as forward or, I don't know, disruptive for a better word, mm -hmm. et cetera? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a good question. Oh man. All right, I can answer this. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm gonna answer this. Um, I'll tell you this, you know, we're in New York, 
And when we bring in our people, so I'm using some real life experiences, when we bring in like our stakeholders or who we need to collaborate with, they get hit with a dose of like New York type of vibe, which I think works in our benefit because it like opens them up to like what is possible, you know? Um, but what ends up happening sometimes is when you start running some of the processes or some of the sprints or, you know, some of the fact finding sessions or, you know, what Info likes to call it, discovery, right? Um, it gets lost really quick because you're like then in a room, you have people that like don't know who each other really is or like what they're coming from or what they're looking to get. Um, so the company culture, I, I would tell you, I think we're working towards singularity of that. Um, but given the way we've been built up, given the work or the mission or the mandate that I think you know my, my organization has been challenged with, I think for us what we've learned is we have to go in completely not like assuming anything, you know, being as neutral as we possibly can. Um, I think this is where the emotional intelligence part starts to come in, and we're realizing that you can't just take some of the people from hook and loop that are like let's just say very green. I mean, like one or two years out of the industry and get them to be like thrown in the room. You need, you need some levels of different experiences. Um, and one of the things that we also saw was, I think what we've learned, and I don't wanna say this is good or bad. I think this is actually gonna apply to all corporate cultures. So to get back to your question, I think you need a good diversity of hierarchy, meaning titles. You know, we're a good school of thought that we like don't believe in titles. You know, we're, we're relatively flat. I think it's worked for us. We're getting to a point where we, st we need a little bit more levels and hierarchy. But when you get into like really deep, rich company cultures and, and where everyone's coming from, sometimes it requires like just because I'm there and it has a VP next to it to then get them to understand that maybe someone who's a designer associate level has something to say. And sometimes I would have to tell you, it might sound a little unfortunate, but those are some of the realities and the challenges that like we're faced in, 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 co in corporate culture. I'm gonna use that. I wanna go back to that because it, it, it's getting better because Hook and Loop isn't in its seven years. But I have to tell you, I think like at scale, at least from what I've heard in the industry, that really reigns true. So with your new acquisition, do you say that the way, the way you roll is seek to understand, then be understood? <laughs> oh man, dude, what are you like? You, you know, you guys open up like I'm some UX Jesus and I'm gonna like flip it to there you. There you go. Um, yeah, I would say that that's valid. Yeah. You know, I, uh, again, it's like anything. A designer needs to understand their medium or understand their context. So if you wanna be successful in anything, you need to go into it without any preconceptions and things. I would tell you this though, the best design thinking processes you do need to go in with some strategic direction. Because trying to drive consensus and answer for the all, don't think you're some like magical like Udini and you're gonna get everyone to say yes. And even if you get majority, majority is not good enough. You know, and uh, there was a really good article. The, the by, way we deal with that in the consulting world is uh, we already have the answer, but we go through a, a workshop where we take everyone's. Are you strategically pick who's the decider, we, and you're going? That's like, the person I got to make. We pretend happy. like we're listening, but then we just go do what we originally yeah. thought, and everyone thought that they had input. There's a good article on Airbnb and, right. and their design review and design process, which really I think struck struck a chord with me. You know, they go through a certain amount of iterations and then they realize like they're gonna have to like make a call, but they might not make the call with their stakeholders there. They like, they go and they try to like initiate that. And it's funny, take a step back and you're getting into more of a little bit more of like an agency mentality, right? Agency always like presented multiple concepts, listen to what you need. And they were like, the third one's the one I want them to pick. And like you strategically set it up so that happened and then they picked it and then they were happy about it. It was embraced and it worked. Oh God, I can't believe I just brought that up. But I wasn't constipated. I was just yeah, saying, yeah, I, I got yeah, it. You know what I'm saying. So, so we, we, we use the term, I'll give you another fortune cookie liner is uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good, which I believe is actually um, more true today in a fast changing market than, than it may have been in, even in the past when it was true. So when things are constantly changing, just tr striving for that perfection costs you time. Oh God. And you don't have time in this yeah. market. Yeah, so I, I, you just got to get out there with I've good. Learned, I've learned that one the hard way. Yeah, you know, um, I, you know, my team typically is like, we're never going to make nuns happy. 
Um, and they do, like they actually do. Right. It's just that like, you know, you've got to be the parent that like no one likes, you know, right. you're always constantly trying to strive for like better fidelity. Right. You know? Um, so you try to figure out the cadence, you know, and, and when I was growing up, they called me NASDAQ nuns. It was like, you know, like, God, yep. what day am I going to get or what flavor? Yep. 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 Um, I like that because it keeps people on toes. I don't know about my relationship. Ask my fiance. Um, but I would have to tell you that, you know, good and doing delivery and continuous delivery, which means like really embracing what software is all about, which is a life cycle. If you can do that and you're continuing to do that, everyone needs to take a step back and realize like they're doing it. Like brush your shoulders off. We did the Jay-Z metaphor, so I just yep. brought it back. Yep. Um, so like totally be down with that. But the reality is that if you don't have people that are going like, you guys are like so talented, like there's so much more that we can do and like try to rally the campaign and then be really hard in reviews. I know that might seem like alter ego personalities or whatever you may call it, but from my experiences and I've, I've built a company, sold a company, I've been here, it's the first place I've ever worked to be totally blunt. It's worked in my benefit is something that I've learned. And I think a lot of people need to be understand how to turn on the switch and shut off the switch constantly to be able to get like really good traction. So a lot of people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, hey, I want to be part of this team. What do they do? Uh, oh, guys? baby, go to hookandloop.design. We dropped NYC because we went global and we're trying to be really, you know, uh, all about uh, being fully inclusive of like our team members. Yep. So go to hookandloop.design. There are a lot of careers, uh, you know, careers that are available. Yep. Uh, reach out to me directly. Believe it or not, like I answer a lot of stuff. So it's yep. like now nuns on Twitter. Um, you could do LinkedIn, even though I don't believe in all those credentials or accolades. Um, but definitely look us up, look up Infor, look up UX, it'll come up. Um, we're hungry. Um, I would tell you we challenge the current models and some of the constraints that we have. Um, and that's, I think, the reason why a lot of people that come here end up staying, because you don't know what next day, you know, what tomorrow is going to bring. And I love living my life that way. Well, that's great. Let's, let's call it a wrap. Let's put this, uh, the headphones down and go cool. grab a beer. Love Vino for me. Okay, Vino. Italian roots. There you go. Sounds All right, good. Thank ciao. you very much. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Karen, I think you were supposed to say that. Yeah, thanks. I'll take it from here. All right, well, we got to do the, this is the new Outcast. Oh, the out outro. The outro. The, I think Outcast is a new word. All okay. right, outro. We're doing a new outro. We got to cover a few things. All right. One is what? Subscription. Do you subscribe to? We want people to subscribe to this, not just listen to it occasionally. Okay, yeah. Check the us out. The second thing is, nothing's better than what? A, a five-star rating. Always five stars. Got to give us the five stars because we get better search outcomes. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is comments. We need those. Yeah, we, we need your feedback. We want to know what people are thinking. So you can check us out. The best way to do it, if you're not sure, some people don't know how to do it. Go to our website. You can check it out. We'll have a full set of instructions. Uh, so whatever app you're using. Most people use, what do you use? Uh, I use Spotify. You do? Yeah. So we have Spotify. We have iTunes, uh, YouTube. There's a whole bunch. Of, whatever you use. We have it. If, and if we don't have it, let us know and we'll try to figure out how to get it. We can send you a paper based instruction. <laughs> actually, actually, we do have paper based instructions, even though that's a fun inside joke to our team. So anyway, yep. thanks for listening and check us out uh, in our next shows. Thanks. See ya.